Hey guys, this is Cyrus, and I want to talk tonight about a very important subject for people who are curious about what happens when you kick the bucket. That's what this channel is about. That's what my work is about. I'm an author of a couple of books, Understanding Life After Death, The Afterlife and Beyond, and I also run AfterlifeTopics.com. And I've been working in this area for about uh, 15 years at least. And it's been my chief concern to objectively investigate what happens when you die. And to do so in a way that is separated from a lot of the New Age movement, as we, as we say. And there is a very important area in this field that people have a difficult time comprehending, difficult time thinking about, and it's the concept that when we die, we actually stay very much ourselves in a real, solid, and most of all, physical environment. And people have always had a difficult time wrapping their minds around this concept. For me personally, when I was a bit newer in this field before I began having my own experiences my own out-of-body experiences and astral projection experiences I also had a difficult time comprehending this and I would I wouldn't say dismiss people who thought of this but I would have a difficult time relating to the concept I would think maybe they were a bit self-deceived or misinterpreting information and if you read mostly certain popular near-death experience accounts certain esoteric literature you'll get the impression that if there is an afterlife then it is this kind of how do you say it dream I would well, I would say dreamlike but <clears throat> completely non-physical so when you sleep you're having a non-physical experience you're basically laying in your bed hallucinating all these random images nothing you know nothing lasts nothing is permanent the, the whole sleep dream state disappears when you wake up you won't see it again you can't m modify something in a dream state and come back to it the next night it's a non-permanent non-physical existence and I think that people who first begin learning about the so-called spirit world they identify it the only way they know how which is by thinking of it as a dream state by relating it to the idea of what it's like to be sleeping and in a impermanent kind of subjective environment inside of your own head but afterlife researchers know this is not the case and people who communicate with the deceased and actually ask the critical questions about what their world is like know that's not the case and I would say those who ask the questions because there's many mediums who don't bother to get that critical information and they still make assumptions about what it's like to be dead without getting the hard facts so the concept is that when you die that the afterlife is a literal real solid place how can this happen how can this work well it makes sense when you begin to think of the concept of densities frequencies so the world we are in right now is one frequency and then if you change the dial you'll you know the um, radio waves still exist you haven't you haven't switched to an entirely different reality but you're just on a different wavelength and that's very much what dead people seem to report about their experiences I personally have experiences in the astral projection state where I can confirm these things and it's all very consistent if you have a chance to talk to somebody who's dead they will tell you that they're in a real living breathing world with houses trees dirt soil um, 
businesses, buildings, pe people go about their lives. It's different than here. There's a lot of physical rules that are no longer uh, applied. People are capable of a lot more that you wouldn't be capable in this, as they would say, lower density environment. But nonetheless, life seems to go on. And I think, I think that one reason people have a difficult time with this is because we're so programmed to think of death as a death, the destruction of what somebody once was. And as a result of that, we interpret the afterlife as a destruction of who and what we once were and to move into this super consciousness, cosmic, non-physical, non-substance-based place where everything that we remember about this world is gone. But that's, again, not what it seems like the facts represent. It seems like that there is this state that we call the astral dimension. The astral dimension is essentially this universe, this planet, this whole you know cosmos. I don't want to say replicated, but it's, its existence on a higher frequency slash higher density. And as a result, life, the life that we know here, kind of carries on on that side. Just now, there's different rules in place. People speak telepathically and physical restrictions are lowered. Consciousness is to an extent expanded, but it's only like one level above where we're at now. And this is um, a contentious issue. And if you're hearing this concept for the first time, it might leave you a bit confused, maybe even a bit angry. Some people, they don't uh, take this information so well, and it goes against a lot of even New Age beliefs. So I want to delve into this concept a bit in this video, a bit more. And again, just so we're clear, I'm talking about when you die, the actual experience you'll have, okay, we talk about going toward the light, life, the life review, meeting guides, meeting angels, all that stuff. But when all that's said and done, we're talking about the concept that you end up in a place that's as real and solid as the life you lead right now and, and actually a replica of the body that you're in right now and you may find yourself someday on that side using a computer just like you're doing right now maybe on their equivalent of YouTube and thinking back to your life back on earth and how how um, how different the afterlife ended up being than what you expected and this concept is not unheard of. It's uh, popularized in media. There's a TV show called The Good Place that's literally about the, this idea. It's a satirical show, so it's not accurate, but it's a, it's a play on that concept. There's an, there's an old film called Defending Your Life, which is literally uh, about this concept as well. And there's a, there's a lot of reports about it. So let's go into... Uh, some accounts of the afterlife that reinforces this idea. So I have opened Michael Tim's blog, uh, part of White Crow Books. It's a very, it's a brilliant blog. It's been on, it's been going on for many years, and it presents a lot of intense afterlife evidence from the annals of spiritualism in the 1800s, 1900s. And uh, this was a recent article called. World War One victim, great Scott, you don't mean I'm dead. And uh, this is an article about uh, the account of a second lieutenant Claude Herschel Kelway Bamber, whose plane was shot down by a German fighter pilot as they were engaged in a dogfight near the Flanders region of Belgium. Claude was just 20 years old and attached to the Royal Flying Corps at the time of his death. Um, here's his tombstone. To summarize a bit, he came through a medium named Gladys Osborne Leonard. Now you might be thinking, oh, a medium. Mediums are all fake. Well, no. Uh, well, there was a 
there's an agenda by pathological skeptics on sites like Rational Wiki or Skeptics Dictionary uh, to discredit all mediums. All that is a political hack job. The truth is, is that there is mediums, especially some historical ones, that were definitively proven to be real. So before I continue with the story of the of our World War One fighter pilot who came back to talk about his experiences on the other side, I'm going to divert a little bit to um, some info about Gladys Osborne Leonard. So you can see that this is about the evidence. It's not just about people's opinions or things like that. Gladys uh, Leonard was a active medium in the first part of the 1900s, so 1910s, 1920s. I uh, believe she didn't pass away until the 1960s, actually. And um, back in the heyday of spiritualism in the Society for Psychic Research out of England, which is still around, and this, they're still doing their thing, uh, they took mediums, especially evidential mediums, very seriously and conducted a lot of tests and ways to verify that they really were communicating with the other side. And Gladys Osborne Leonard is considered one of the most um, evidentiary. So I apologize if we hear a bunch of dogs barking. That's the thing about not editing these videos. Uh, they, right about this time of night, my, my roommate comes down and then they all start barking and whimpering and whining. Maybe we'll get lucky. Anyway. So Gladys Osborne Leonard. Um, so one of the tests that, that she underwent was known as the book tests. And this was a simple way to verify that a medium was gaining anomalous information. I'm surprised these types of tests are not performed so much these days. So the idea behind the book test was to communicate information gleaned by the, by the father. So let me back up. The, there was a... Uh, 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 a man named, uh, let's see, Charles Drayton Thomas, senior, passed away in 1903, told his son that there be test be, would be devised to confirm his post-mortem existence, right? So now the son is going through the medium, and there's an experiment taking place to, to verify that he's really in touch with his father. Okay, so the idea behind the book test was to communicate information gleaned by the father from a book in the son's extensive library. For example, in one of the earliest experiments, the father told the son to go to the lowest shelf and take the sixth book from the left on page 149, three quarters down. He would find a word conveying the meaning of falling back or stumbling. When the younger Thomas arrived home that evening after his sitting with Mrs. Leonard, he went to the book and put the book and went to the uh, specified page where he found the words to whom a crucified messiah was an ins insuperable stumbling block, right? So what was going on here is that Leonard was connecting with a, a spirit guide named Feta, and this guide was then relaying information like through this kind of complicated process of um, Thomas Sr. And as the experiments progressed, it became more and more, um, more and more specific with examples from the books. So if uh, they want to talk about the garden, it's, you know, the message would be go to page 58, book three, and then there would be a, um, a phrase, a sentence about a garden, right, to simplify it. And so why is this important? Because, of course, Gladys Osborne Leonard had no access to uh, this, this man's bookshelf. So... This created this kind of blind study. Now we see that happening still today, like with the work of work of like Dr. Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona. He conducts blind studies and has confirmed some highly evidential mediums. He would do some information. It was certain that Mrs. Leonard had never visited Thomas's house and knew nothing of the library of books in it. Realizing, however, that a subconscious might somehow have recorded such information. Again, the, the, the idea that maybe the medium is reading the sitter's mind, which would still be phenomenal, but 
that was a possibility that uh, researchers had to, had to take into account. Thomas decided to experiment with books in a friend's house. He informed his father of the plans that the father knew where to search. And then in one of the tests there, Feta, the, the spirit guide, spirit control, told Thomas that on page two of the second book from the right on a particular shelf, he would find a reference to the sea or the ocean. Uh, she added that the discarnate Thomas was not sure which because he got the idea and not the words. So this has to do with how information is conveyed mentally. It's difficult to get the specific details sometimes, but um, it's easier to transmit like bigger concepts when you're communicating through this kind of rough telepathic channel. When, when Drayton Thomas pulled the book from the shelf of his friend's house, he read a first-rate seaman grown old between sky and ocean. So again, they're referencing pages in a book. There's no way that... Um, Mrs. Leonard would know which book, which page. Uh, only only uh, uh, Thomas Jr. would have had access to this information. So repeatedly, every sitting, it was confirmed that Gladys Osborne Leonard was the real deal. So now we'll go back to Michael Tim's article. And actually, I think this was also an article by Michael Tim. It was rehosted on compellingevidenceforthealterlife.com. It's a cool URL. You should check them out. Okay. So Claude, coming through Gladys Osborne Leonard, discusses at length what it's like in the so-called spirit world after we die. And, uh, da, 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 da. so Claude recounts being struck down in the, in the sky during a dogfight in World War I. Claude went on to explain that when he and his accompanying a accompanying observer were attacked by two enemy planes. His feeling was one of complete irritation. As they were on their way back after finishing some work over the enemy lines, I felt harassed as I climbed and turned and dived here and there to attack. My observer, which is, uh, I believe it was a, uh, like, a, I want to say co-pilot, but there's, a, there's an individual in the plane with him who survived, but he did not. My observer said something, and I remember getting the nose of the machine down to get below one of our opponents when I felt a terrible blow on my head, a sensation of dizziness and falling, and then nothing more. And what happened is that um, the, the plane had been struck by enemy fire into the cockpit. It shot and killed Claude, whereas the observer, who is some some position, like a co-pilot basically, uh, survived and was able to escape the plane. The observer, later identified as Lieutenant J.E.P. Harvey, was quoted in the March 22nd issue of Calgary Herald as saying that they were at about 10,000 feet and Claude was hit in the head and killed. So they went into a death plunge for about 5,000 feet, during which time Harvey was able to maneuver onto Claude's lap, take the controls, shut off the engine, and land safely, after which he was taken prisoner by the Germans, which probably in World War I, not the worst thing that'll happen to you if you get taken as prisoner because you're less likely to die in a POW camp than the front lines. But I don't mean to go on a tangent. Okay. Next, Claude, after his death, through the highly evidential medium, Gladys Osborne Leonard, says, It may have been a fortnight or more later. We have no account of time here, so I cannot be sure that I became conscious again. Now, a fortnight... A I believe that's a period of about two weeks. Uh, and, you know, he has no account of time, so that's something everybody recounts. Everybody reports from that side is that there's no timekeeping. I don't know if it means that there's no time per se, but there's no Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, or 12 o'clocks, or 6, six o'clocks. But he's saying that it felt like it must have been about two weeks that he was unconscious after death. He says, I felt, Claude accounts, recounts, I felt dizzy and stupid, but I was not in pain. And on collecting my thoughts and looking around, found myself in a bed in an unknown room. So this is what happens after he died. He was in this world, he got shot in the head, and he was unconscious for about two weeks. Um, and... So after about two weeks, he says, before thought took definite form, I felt I had been passing through space. 
my body seemed to have become light. Here we go with the dogs. Can't do much about that. I almost just want to like wait it out. I have these ridiculous dogs and they, uh, right about this time of night, every night, my roommate has to take them out and then they just, you know, they go haywire. This wasn't so bad. I think they're back upstairs now. Thank God. Anyway, uh, before thought took definite form, I felt I'd been passing through space. My body seemed to have become very light. Kind of sounds like a near-death experience, right? Some near-death experiences, they kind of, they go through a period of what, it's like they're traveling through the cosmos a bit. They say they feel very light. We hear about this in NDEs. He says, I wondered if I was in a hospital and if anyone had written uh, to uh, tell me I was wounded. Uh, nurses moved about the room. If I attempted to talk or ask questions, a doctor came to my side and putting his hand on my head soothed me to silence again. And I'll say that uh, I do astral types of work and uh, I've been in hospitals like this with new arrivals. I toured one once. I know these experiences are a little bit of a stretch, but I'm saying I've, I've had experiences to verify some of this stuff. What seemed like several days later, a doctor came to Claude's bedside and explained to him that he had passed out of the physical body. With much confusion, Claude replied, Great Scott, you don't mean I'm dead. And the doctor replies, We'll use that term simply as it's the only one you understand, the doctor responded. You are alive and starting the fuller and more beautiful life. Shortly thereafter, Claude was guided by two other spirits through the astral plane to Earth and found himself standing at the foot of his mother's bed. It was then that he realized he was indeed dead. He observed his mother sitting up in bed in an agony of grief. He says, I bent forward and called as loudly as I could. Mummy, I'm here. Can you see or hear me? And you made no reply. I went to your side and put my arms around you, and though you are not conscious of my presence, I seemed to be able to soothe you, for you became calmer, and you laid down. As he began to lose consciousness in the earth realm, his two guides took him back to the hospital. I felt, however, that your love was mine still, he continued. Back up. So he was on the earth plane, so he was in this kind of near-earth astral I talk about something that I've experienced in, in, in my out-of-body experiences but it's like his consciousness was was dropping while he was there it's similar to when I'm having an out-of-body experience I'm going to their their world my consciousness is like on a meter you know it was like it was like there was like a little bar and it's like decreasing it's going down and that's how long I can stay in their realm until I lose consciousness and when I lose consciousness on that side I, I, I switch back to this side so it's interesting, there's like a parallel there. He continued, I could feel its power. I understood it and realized it better than before. It was a spiritual caress and I felt it through every fiber of my body and was full of thankfulness. I knew too that in all my life, your love had never failed me and that even now you would find a way, if it were possible, to bridge the gulf between us. You would never let me drop out. When I realized this, I knew the worst was over and the bitterness of death had passed. Worn by my emotions, I slept and woke later in quite a different mood. There's a lot of sleeping going on. Again, people can't imagine, how can you have biological, physical functions on that side? Well, you certainly do. If your body is a replica of the body here, it's just that the mind has control of the body there. So you can eat, drink, sleep, make love. <laughs> anything you want to do except you're no longer held prisoner by the body's functions that's the big difference that I, that spirits teach us as claude adapted to his new environment he was able to better communicate with his mother although he pointed out several times that so much of what he was experiencing was beyond his ability to explain there was so much that it was so difficult to put into words especially to have to imprint on another person that to that which to us is a great shining light, the truth. We feel it, we move in it, we breathe in it, but it's too great and fast a thing to explain in an hour or so. For no sooner do I start to explain one phase than I find it leads me to have to explain another and then another and so on. 
we are nearer the infinite than you are, and am therefore more naturally conscious of the power of the infinite. So what he's saying is that your consciousness is expanded on that side in ways that our consciousness is not. Which is interesting because on the surface that world looks like this world in many ways, and yet people's conscious abilities is vastly improved by comparison to here. Now we're getting to that, the interesting parts. And not that anything else wasn't interesting, but this is kind of the meat and potatoes of this article. As his guides, including his deceased grandfather, escorted him around, Claude observed homes, gardens, fountains, and woods similar to those on Earth. He asked his grandfather if it was a thought-based world he was now in. And he responded, let me back up. Again, this mirrors so many people's conceptions about the afterlife in 2018, 100 years after this, this recollection, of people believing the afterlife is a purely thought-generated realm, that whatever you think is there. We even kind of saw this in the old film, somewhat old, 20 years, uh, What Dreams May Come with Robin Williams, where it's kind of like whatever he thought of was being created around him. We hear about this in certain near-death experiences. And I think these types of environments do exist, but the kind of nuts and bolts astral environment doesn't quite, isn't quite like that so much. It's more, it's more of a physical solid place. The grandfather says it is more real and permanent than the one you have left. Claude added that he bent down and poked his finger in the soil and found that it left a hole while the soil stuck under his nail. I've done the same thing in astral states. I've also eaten spices. I've induced gagging. One time I unscrewed the lid on a thing of garlic salt in my cabinet. Note the cabinet in my home on the astral side. And I started like pouring it in my mouth until I began gagging. And then the experience ended because I had this intense physical reaction to something I was doing. Shows you again, real physical solid place. We still have physical bodies in the afterlife. And it's a physical world. Hence soil stuck under his nail. Not a dream. If it was a dream, things wouldn't be permanent any longer then you can blink your eyes. Everything would just be in flux and nothing, nothing would be continuous from one moment to the next. That's not what this is. This is a continuation of the type of realm that we're in right now. Claude told his mother that he did not think of death very often when alive in the flesh, even though he faced it every day in combat because it seemed so indefinite. He considered the possibility that he would be killed and hoped he would find himself in heaven. But heaven did not sound very appealing to him, as he did not think of it as anything more than sitting on a throne or a cloud in a white robe while playing a harp. People still think this stuff today. It sounded terribly boring to him. He says, I know now the whole mistake lies and looking upon death as the end of activity, with a renewal at some indefinite date, where as a matter of fact it is an incident only, though a very important one in a continuous life. How many Buddhists do we know who think that death is a deletion until reincarnation happens, right? He explained, your feelings, your memory, your love, your interests and ambitions remain, all that you have left behind, and even that which one cannot at first realize, is the physical body, which proves to be merely the covering of the spiritual, to enable it to function in a material world. Man truly is a spirit and has a body, not vice versa. So we are all of us non-physical consciousness, but we inhabit bodies for a purpose, to interact in the realms we wish to explore. Here we are glued to our bodies, on that side, we call the shots. The bodies don't control us, but we still have all the benefits of having a body. Initially, Claude was engaged in assisting other soldiers who had been killed in the battlefield. We are united for the work, having ourselves endured the horrors of war. 
Spirits unused to it cannot bear the terrible sights and sounds. We bring them away so they may return to consciousness far from their mutilated physical bodies. And, oh, Mom, I feel quite tired sometimes of explaining to men that they are dead. They wake up feeling so much the same. Some go about for days and even months believing they are dreaming. Death works no miracle, and you wake up here the same personality exactly that left the earth plane. Your individuality is intact, and your spirit body is a replica of the one you have left, down to small details. Even deformities remain, though I am told they lessen and disappear in time. Uh, I have been told by spirit communicators that uh, when you pass over, you're initially in an exact body when you left, but your level of conscious ability will determine how your body changes. So if you've done some practice, if you're good maybe at meditating, you can gain control of your consciousness over your ethereal body, and then you can begin to adjust it and look like how you want to look. So people who have been over there a while, you can usually tell because they're very pretty looking, you know, very beautiful people. Uh, but people who are a bit newer arrivals, you can also tell because when you see old men walking around, old men, old women, more likely they're a bit newer because they haven't changed their physical appearance yet. They haven't learned how to do it. One of the more evidential facts related by Claude through Leonard, Leonard was that his spirit body was initially just the same as his physical body, right down to the wart on my finger. Mrs. Kilway Bamber recalled suggesting to Claude that he see the doctor and have the wart removed. People with narrow set and orthodox beliefs are puzzled by the reality of the ordinariness, if I may coin a word, of the spirit world, Claude continued. If it were described to them as flashes of light, mauve and sapphire clouds, golden rivers, they would more readily approximate with their preconceived ideas. They require this mystery about the future life. I often laugh when I hear them complain they can't believe in solid things like houses and gardens in the spirit world. This is the New Age Isle in a nutshell. Uh, even today, there is a contradiction between what New Age writers say about the afterlife and what dead people say about the afterlife. And people get defensive about this because there is this grandiosity painted about the afterlife. Certainly, there is a grandiosity to the astral side of existence and grandiosity amid higher levels. I recommend books like Jurgen Ziway's uh, Multidimensional Man, Vistas of Infinity, particularly Vistas of Infinity, talks about these higher heavenly celestial realms that people can go to even through out-of-body experiences. So yes, there are these grandiose realms, but most of us go to the Earth-like realms, which are also way more beautiful than this side. But it's not um, this, this indescribable element that people paint. Uh, and so people die, and then they're surprised by how normal it is. They're surprised that they go outside, there's birds in the trees, uh, there's soil, there's people gardening, there's people who have houses, and in my experience, there's people who have jobs. I've seen people working at everything from restaurants to um, office buildings, in my experiences. And it shows you that the astral side of Earth is a neighboring civilization to our own on a higher density where people's minds are operating on a different level. Uh, people have different abilities, and life is undoubtedly far more pleasant than this one. But um, it's, a, it's a continuation of this life. Claude went on to say that he was doing less and less battlefield work as he was being trained to be a teacher. I realize enough, even in this short time, to know that the more one learns... The more truly humble one becomes, because it's only then possible to know of the vast, untouched fields of knowledge yet to be explored. And it's only very ignorant people in these days who say anything is impossible, because it happens to be beyond their particular understanding. And that, that finishes this article. As we speak, we have advanced electronic communication work happening with Sonia Rinaldi out of Brazil who's been in direct communication with Nikola Tesla, whose voice comes through her airwaves, 
crystal clear. Sounds just like Nikola Tesla. And this communication has led to uh, people going to the laboratory on the astral side and uh, sending messages to their deceased loved ones here. So we have clear images of people's faces coming through the, the transmission screens, an extremely clear audio clips, EVP as they say, coming through Sonia's laboratory. And uh, this was heavily documented and um, present, uh, presented much detail at this year's Afterlife Symposium in, in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, where I spoke at uh, a couple months ago. And uh, that gives you an idea of the kind of developments that are happening. And all of it relates to this idea that when we die, there is this parallel to our own world that people go to, that where civilization as it is here continues. And this life is just the first part of a much, much, much longer life. And that seems to be the accurate perception of what happens when we die. And those who go out of body, they report the same thing. I report that in my books, but don't take my, my word for it. You can learn to have out-of-body experiences yourself. You can potentially learn to go to that side, talk to dead people, and guess what? They'll tell you the same things in this article. Dead people I've talked to, they tell me the same things that Claude talks about a hundred years ago in this article. It's all pretty consistent. So if you want to know what happens when you die, maybe that's not as glamorous as people were hoping. I know people have these lofty, lofty ideas, but that seems to be the, re the reality of it. At least in this writer's opinion. Well, uh, I have some more about this, actually. I don't think I have time to get into it, but these are some slides, uh, presentations that I put together for Afterlife University about the literal conditions of the afterlife, about what the astral is like, basics of life there, life on the astral Earth, um, how long it tends to last before people move to higher realms. I like these illustrations of some, you know, some concepts of kind of what it looks like on that side it's a lot more grandiose than here uh, people communicate by telepathy sometimes locomotion is via teleportation Age, our ages regress people can move between realms and planets and there's, there's endless varieties uh, advanced mental phenomena uh, in the second class we talk about cultural differences between our worlds and, and those worlds occupations, lifestyle differences, people regressing to their more beautiful states, um, weird things you see when you astral travel. I encountered that somebody once who had a talking pair of shoes, just like in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. It was like a talking shoe that had a mouth and eyeballs. He created that out of his, out of his thoughts, and you know he was kind of a crazy homeless guy. People, people were staying away from him, and he was making all kinds of weird stuff happen. It's fantastical realms, floating buildings, floating cities, and such. Um, I don't think I have time to go into these those full presentations. I will say, if you are curious and you want to get involved more, if you like this presentation, then uh, become an Afterlife Topics patron. Patron. Tomato, tomato. Pat patron? Patron? Uh, become a student at Afterlife Topics. And we hold classes about eight times a month. Uh, the afterlife, complex metaphysical subjects, and you can support the work that I do, the work that others are doing right now in uh, the Afterlife Topics group. Uh, sometimes projects cost money, books cost a lot of money to, to put out there, and if you want to become a student, become a patron, then uh, shoot me a message on here, on Facebook, Cyrus Kirkpatrick, or on the Afterlife Topics Facebook group, and um, become one of the students. And it's uh, 30 bucks a month, and we archive all the classes, we do in-depth presentations about this kind of stuff, and it would help us out a lot. So if, you're, if you want to get involved with that and have some of these in-depth classes about the afterlife, then uh, yeah, let me know. Uh, so that is pretty much it. I wanted to make this video to make these uh, less commonly discussed points about what we can expect when we kick the bucket guess what we're all gonna kick the bucket no one gets out of here alive to quote Morrison and given that's a fact makes some sense to start thinking about what happens 
after our hearts stop beating. So this is Cyrus at AfterlifeTopics.com, and I'll catch you guys on the other side.